I'm going to ask that you mute your phone, just in case you have some additional background noise. Um, we don't want to have that on the call on the recording. This is being recorded, so as soon as we're done and it loads, I will upload it to my YouTube channel. That there, that way, other people can have access to the meeting. Um, this is a brainstorming session. So I am not an expert at the coronavirus or anything like that. My degree is in music education. Um, but I believe that music has always um, been able to stand the test of time. So even back in the biblical days, there was all kind of stuff that happened back then. But you know what? They always had some type of choir or there was always some type of singing that was going on during those times. Um, throughout all the world wars that have happened, throughout history, no matter what happens, society rebounds and music still stands. So I believe with everything in me that when coronavirus, COVID-19, when it is all over, music and choir will still stand. And I want to have a conversation about how we as educators, uh, choir directors, um, people who love singing, how we can be creative with music during this time. So I do have a few, just a few ground rules. I do ask that if you have a question um, or you want to speak, that you either, there's a button that you can raise your hand, you can either raise your hand that way or you just type it in the chat. I ask that we all be respectful. No idea is a dumb idea. I mean, we, we really are getting ready to, con to control the narrative of what choir will be and we have to think outside the box like we really really have to start being creative with how we thinking um so just as the world changed I mean, if you think about it three months ago we all was teaching in classrooms and then just like that we all became online teachers some of us have an experience and some of us have no idea how to do it but guess what we did we did it and we we've been doing it well congratulations to all of us we've been doing this well and in doing it well, now it's time for us to do something different. So now we have to think about what choir looks like after COVID-19. I want this to stay positive. Um, I, I'm sorry if, if fear has taken you over. Um, we will not be fearful going after this. Fear, fear causes anxiety and all kind of other stuff. We're, we can't operate like that. So we want to operate in our creative brains. Um, musicians are some of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. So if anybody can figure out how to do this, we, the music makers, can figure this out. And so I'm excited to have this conversation with you all. I'm excited to, to hear your, your ideas. Um, I know we have all walks of life on this call. We have church choir directors, community choir directors, elementary, middle school, high school, college choir directors all on the call. And I'm excited to hear from all of you all. So. With that being said, um, we were presented with uh, a situation a few weeks, uh, was it last week, where we were told that choir is going to change. And um, they kind of didn't give us a, they didn't give us really anything else after that. They just said it's going to change. And then they said, we'll come back in a few weeks and tell you all how to manage that, which is fine. I am very much looking forward to that conversation in a few weeks. But in the meantime, my brain got the role and it said, Maria, what can you be doing now for your singers? How can you be helping them going forward? And that's, that's the conversation that I want to have. What can we be doing now? The great thing about it is summer is coming, which gives us some time, right? That gives us time to really be planning and thinking about what we can do to help our singers, what choir will look like, um, and control the narrative. The way I feel, if the NFL, NHL, MLB and all those other three letter words can figure out how to play sports and all those great contact sports, then we definitely can figure out how to sing and how to keep it safe. Okay, does that make sense for everybody? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. All right, so for those who are just joining in the chat, I put, um, there's a Google form in the chat um, that I ask that you fill it out so we can have your information so that we can continue to have these conversations. And what I would love to do is after we have this brainstorming session, then maybe um, we have a meeting with elementary educators, with middle school educators, with community choir educators, with high school, college, and then church choirs and stuff. We can just start having those groups because it looks different for everybody. I'm in Missouri, 
um, where COVID is not like it is in New York. So it's different for everybody. So to put one blanket out for everybody, I don't think that's fair or safe because all our situations is not, are not the same. But there are some things that we can, that we can start thinking about. So I started thinking about what I would do with my choir. So I conduct two community choirs. Um, one is elementary and one is a high school choir. And the space that we have, we, re we rehearse in a big space. So I can safely stick my 29 kids all around the room so they can all sing safely. That works for me. But um, if I have a choir of 50, that may not work because I may not have the space for that. So that's what I want to talk about. What can we do creatively? What can we do to think outside the box about um, having choir? Somebody mentioned having choir outside. That's an idea. You definitely can do it outside if the wind is not blowing towards you. I think they said the wind had to blow like towards your back or something like that. So we can definitely do that. But that only works when the weather is good because when it's raining, can't go outside and have choir. So those are, those are the things that I want to talk about. And please just, I can see the majority of you all, raise your hand or, or, or place it in the chat if you have something to have an idea. And let's just talk through ideas. Um, I'd like to have this call go for one hour to be respectful of everybody's time. But just to really think of what ideas that you may have out there. So I am open and ready for ideas. All right, Ms. Cody, I will share the link again. You may have to just put it in the browser because it's not showing up as like a live link. So you may have to put just in your browser to, um, to, to link to it. But what are your ideas of how we can get this done? What are your thoughts? How can we be creative with choir? And there are ways to do this. All right, Eric Wilson. Eric, go ahead, Eric. You can unmute yourself. Hey, 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 everybody. Um, I'm Eric Williamson. I am an elementary educator in Brooklyn, New York. I'm also a community choir director with the Brooklyn Youth Chorus and a church choir director. So I have many hats, several ideas. Some of them could be not so good. Um, but I, I want to start with the community choir first because I think that one there's a lot more flexibility. So a lot of our groups rehearse for maybe two hours a week per so or so. Um, and our class sizes and ranges of like maybe from 30 to about 50 singers at a time. So I was thinking maybe figuring out a way to work within the confines of those two hour blocks to do small group um, project-based type of learning where you know we're taking groups eight to ten kids at a time to be in the space for let's say 20 minutes and you're doing vocal work or you're working on repertoire or they're able to work independently within a small group electronically on one aspect of vocal technique or musicianship um, and they have like that piece of time where you're only seeing those x amount of kids in a small group within a large space where you can still do the social distancing you can still get the face time and then they can use the rest of the time within that two-hour space to work independently on that project based thing or that repertoire or that skill that you want to work on for that week and in terms of my experience as an elementary educator um, they're think they're talking about all kinds of craziness for new york city in terms of what we're doing in the fall um, but i think something similar along those lines but we can easily tie in more cross-curricular things where we're talking about you know social emotional learning um, especially at the elementary age like music is really the center of supporting students in terms of building those skills um, so I feel like it's it's easier for us within the elementary space to get creative in terms of ways we can marry um, different curriculum into music whether it's helping them with mathematics whether it's helping them with history whether it's helping them with like how to talk to each other, you know, this is how you wash your hands, we're gonna make a song, you know, little things like that that we're kind of already doing. It's easier for us to be creative in terms of that, but when it comes to choir, I feel like we're, limit we're limited to space and time um, within the confines of K through 12 education. So just maybe we need to think of ways that we can have a smaller ensemble that, you know, operates and performs at the same level as a large group but you know, trying to downsize that so we can still 
you know, hit our markers in terms of like safety and um, just making sure that we're not spreading the virus since we're super spreaders apparently. So that's what I got. So I like your idea um, for the community choir. I know one idea that I had as far as community choir, like I was thinking about my church choir, um, maybe church choir or community choir, maybe you just rehearse sections of the group. So maybe, and it may, this may be a little more work on our end, but maybe the first hour is the sopranos and then the next hour are the altos and then the next hour are the tenors or basses or whatnot, but just spreading out those groups. I also like what you said about um, the elementary learners. Uh, I, think, I think we have the greatest opportunity to mix with core subjects. And, and, and help teach core subjects because everything that I know, I've learned it through a song. I learned the alphabet through a song. Um, I now know my prime numbers through a song because I taught a song to my, to my daughter for prime numbers, but I've always used songs to help me learn. So creating songs about planets and, and history or making a rap about history or something like that, like, like that thinking out of the box so we can, we can compare, we can, you know, meet up with another subject would be great. So that's that's a great, great idea. I really like that. Go One ahead, more Eric. thing, Maria, I, I meant to say is um, concerning like choirs and teaching harmony, um, I think, and this may be a little controversial, I think we should need to get away from harmony within this setting because it's not fun. There's no real functional way for us to do that in a virtual setting. So what I've been doing with my choirs is everything is unison and I'm really teaching fundamental vocal technique. We're working on building up the voice. We're working on vocal registration. We're working on about like the nitty gritty things of how you can sing anything and not really doing any any of like the harmonic things since like the way, you know, technology is set up, there's always feedback. You can't really sing with someone. Yeah. Um, it's just so many limitations. I mean, I'll still teach the vocal line of a harmony, but the basis of it is just like, what is the voice? How is the voice functioning? How does it sound? what we can do to analyze what our own voice is doing, whether, whereas, you know, a lot of focus before has been on part singing and teaching parts individually, so. But what about if, um, I, haven't, I haven't done a virtual choir, congratulations to everyone who has, I haven't done that yet with my students, but what about if, you know, I, I believe the way the virtual choir works is I send out a track to you and you sing to your part, is that, yep, yeah, I see people nodding heads, okay. So what if, um, to do the harmony part, I sent out the soprano track and the altos had to sing with that track. I mean, cause technically you could still be doing, you could still practice the harmony, I mean, unless I'm wrong, but technically I think you could still practice the harmony in that way, that way they're still singing their parts. Think about, I know like when we do, um, when we have state singing, like when our kids and students are preparing for all state or for district choirs, one of the requirements is they sing, like in the track they'll have soprano, tenor and bass and they'll just be missing the alto. So that way you're still teaching that harmony and then still able to work with them, having them record that, and then you going back in as a teacher and working with them and helping them with that part. Like that's that's the way where we can still get the harmony put in there. So I mean those are things that we can we can we can consider. I'm gonna go uh Miss Lozano and then I'll come to you, Cody. Okay. Uh, you're muted. We can't hear you. Mm -mm. Sorry, you can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my name's Lakeidra Lozano. I teach at a super small school. Uh, we are K through 12. I also direct a church choir. So I have three different groups. But my high school choir is my, my I guess, my top choir. Um, we should probably rethink, I love all these ideas because um, Anytime you can work with the elementary teachers, like anytime you can work with a core subject teacher, we're core. I hope y'all know that, right? We're all core subject teachers. <laughs> so anytime you can work with your classroom teacher on anything, please do it because, you know, it shows them that we appreciate them. Hopefully it gets them to appreciate us. You know, some people are hard to work with. But in terms of like high school choirs, some of your choirs are huge. Mine has 10 people in it. So with that being said, we're good. We can safely social distance that. However, we think your choir configuration. So if you have more than, you know, 25 people, but you have a large room, you know, I, I've, uh, there's uh, nothing wrong with 
spreading out in an auditorium. I don't know how many of y'all have done that already. Spread out in an auditorium and sing in those, um, they call it a processional, but you know, everybody stops in the auditorium, right? It spreads out and sings, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and then they walk up on stage, right? So there are ways to rehearse a bigger group if you have that kind of space. So you might want to rethink your section configurations, rethink your placements for your singers. So, you know, maybe you don't have sopranos, all the sopranos together, or all the altos together. You know, maybe you don't have that. Um, you just rethink and, you know, it, it's, again, a little bit more work. Um, sectionals is a wonderful idea, um, uh, especially since some of us don't know what our schools are going to look like in the fall. Um, you know, some uh, I've heard some states are going for this like four model, a couple students here and there every other day or something like that. So, you know, if you have a class of, you know, girls or boys or whatever, rethink, you know, section was our wonderful idea. Um, chamber choirs, rethink the structure of your whole choir makeup. Maybe the class just becomes a chamber choir of maybe 20 people that you rehearse every other day, you know what I mean? So maybe you have to do some reconfiguration that way as well. Um, I, like that, I like that you said about um, spacing out in the auditorium. I know um, where I graduated from, University of Missouri, St. Louis, um, our auditorium had a, we, we have a huge auditorium. And just thinking about, I see it was a video I saw where they had people on stage, but everybody was distanced out, but they were still on stage all singing together. So it wasn't the normal riser setup, but they just had people throughout the whole stage um, distance out so they could still sing together. Or like you said, having people in the aisles like we do for the processionals and things like that when it's around the holiday season time, putting people in the aisles, putting people in rows. In our, at our church, we have, our church is a nice size, but we have lots of pews. So maybe rehearsing throughout the pews where you have people sectioned off so that they're not standing, number one, Nobody's standing right in front of each other, um, but you're spaced out. You have space where you can still rehearse. So that's that's a good way of thinking about it. Miss Cody, you had your hand up. I'll come to you next, love. Hello, everyone. My name is Cody Raven Morris, and I am uh, the new choir director at Crosby High School uh, on the east side of Houston, Texas. Also, proud graduate. Thank you proud graduate of Michigan State University as of this past Saturday with my master's in choral conducting. So I'm real pumped about that. Oh, look at those little quiet claps. Yes, quiet claps. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, I was quite upset, though it was um, informal in the sense of science, the approach that was uh, taken with the video that most of us saw from Nats and ACDA did not leave a lot of hope um, for a lot of people, and I don't mean false hope, but I mean uh, being proactive. So um, I have a lot of things, but just to stay in the narrative that we're in about what we can do, because that's what it's all about, I think in general we need to rethink what we do in a rehearsal. And so um, I'm normally, for lack of a better word, catering to middle school or high school, that's my main jam, rehearsals of 45 minutes to 90 minutes long, where the students are on risers and they're all in front of you. What if, if we take away the, the aspect of numbers, because I'll be honest, I haven't thought that part through. If, I, if no one changes the numbers of students that are in my class, I need to limit their air production as much as, much as possible. So we can do adjustments with space and moving them in different spaces, but I could do more music theory during the day and they could do more singing at home. And I've been experimenting with uh, my assignments that I've been doing in distance learning. I've actually already started my position in Houston. I actually started on April 15th. So I'm using this last window as a time to experiment with how I'm going to do learning via Zoom or uh, other mediums. And so I've made some practice tracks and different things that, um, that leave room for call and response. And so you could have a practice track that you make of a part for a song and then leave space so that your student could sing back. Well, how do you do that? If I play it on my computer, there's a delay. Well, I threw it in a Google Drive and had students open up the track. So I'm hearing them in time with that, with said track. And then I'm sitting here with a tablet or a note paper and I'm making an assessment that way. So they're hearing my model or a different model and then reduplicating that sound. You're in class and students are quiet with or without mask, however your, your campus or your classroom functions. And then you can do more visual um, 
more visual work and more ear training work. And I think the biggest misconception that a, a lot of us need to need to address is that music learning is not synonymous with performance consistently 100%. When you teach ear training and when you teach sight reading, we know that practice doesn't come with singing over and over and over and over and over again. That's how you beat a dead horse. So I think this is an opportunity for us to actually teach kids what practicing actually is. And that can happen with less singing in front of you and more singing in response online. I don't want to dominate the, the conversation, but I just want to throw out that concept. No, I think that's, that's a really good concept, Cody. Like that's, that's really good. That's really, really, really good. That's, that's really something to think about. Um, I like the Google Drive idea. Um, that's something that I didn't think about, but that's a great idea uh, about, the, about Google Drive. Okay, I'm going Mr. Dalberry. I don't want to say anything wrong. Mr. Hartman, I see you. Mr. Dalberry, then Miss Wendy, and then Mr. Hartman. So unmute. Just thank you. Thank you. How are y'all? Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Awesome. Awesome. My name is Antoine Dalberry. I am also a teacher in New York, elementary music, pre-K through fifth grade and chorus instructor. Um, and of course here in New York, it's, you know, pretty bad in terms of everything. And so we haven't <laughs> touched the school since March. Um, but I, I think that um, we need to focus more on content nowadays. I think a lot of choirs usually focus a lot on performance, 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 performance. Um, so instead of worrying about that, we focus on content rather than performance, like what do the lyrics mean of our songs? More project-based learning, like maybe have your elementary kids writing a song at home, you know, and then putting it to notes and music via um, Zoom or whatever your virtual platform you're using. Also, um, in terms of the virtual choir thing, I know for me, you know, we're all in the process of getting stuff ready for graduations and virtual graduations and stuff like that. Um, and so choosing repertoire has been um, difficult for that. And so for me, I know that I'm choosing a lot of repertoire that features soloists rather than the entire group. That way it's easier to put together um, in terms of editing and mixing all that stuff and voices. And then the last one I was going to make was that perhaps if we get back to school in the fall and, you know, folks are around and agreeing with this whole choir thing, you know, creating choirs out of choirs. So if you have a choir that is like mine, that is like 80 kids, right? Maybe increase the number of days that you have chorus. Cause right before we um, went on this break, I had, chorus once a week with all 85 of my children in one room which is the auditorium so maybe i can do it monday wednesday thursday friday and have 20 kids at a time mm. um they're learning the same music and then when you have a performance you take those 20 kids you know and you have that you know performance it creates more independence within them um and it also creates you know uh, opportunity for them to shine because a lot of kids you know they feed off of other people's energy some of them don't sing because they're shy and so that might be a good idea for to create a choir out of a choir kind of thing i'm going back on mute mr Dunbar, somebody asked in the uh chat they said what what are you using to um to record your students um so like the virtual choir so what so what we do is um, like you all have been saying, we send in the track. Um, we're doing stand up from the movie Harriet, right, for graduation. And so I recorded myself on the track, on the instrumental track, so that they can have a reference in their ear. They get the track, they need two devices, right? So, or whatever it is, plug their headphones in and they're listening to the song and, as they're recording their video on another device. That way, when I get their video back, I don't hear the music. I just hear their audio of, their, of them singing. Um, it's easier to mix. Um, I send it to a friend of mine. My frat brother is an amazing engineer. Um, and so I luckily have that, that crutch. Um, and the video aspect is kind of just laying the videos alongside the track. In iMovie, some people use um, lynda.com. 
Um, I believe that's how you spell it right there. Um, and there's one other one that I'm, I can't think of right now, but when I get it, I will put it in the chat. Okay. And if not, um, if you can't think of it, just email it to me. My email address is girlconductor at iCloud.com. So definitely email it to me because I'm going to be sending things out. Okay. Miss Wendy, we are up to you, love. Wherever you are. Miss Wendy. Sorry. Wait. Go. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I teach um, lower school music at a school in San Diego, California. And at this point, they're telling us that we've been out since March and I've been teaching asynchronous um, music classes. Um, the big question that that hasn't been answered yet is how many students we're actually going to have back in school in real life and how many of them are still going to be like distance learning. So one of the things I'm toying with is the idea of picking um, like a genre theme and we really study that and focus on it and not worry about performances. We're not going to have any live performances next year at all. Like they're taking it out of the calendar completely. Um, but the idea of having students work on a song that they like and record it, and then I can put a compilation, not necessarily of a choir, but individuals that are singing sections of the song and sort of string it together that way. Um, but I, the the big idea that everybody seems to be saying is, is there's so much more to studying choir than just the performance aspect and i've had a really good time the last eight weeks getting to finally teach the stuff i never have time to because i don't have a show to worry about so getting into issues like jazz and and um latin uh, jazz and just really focusing on the music history and the listening and playing along with percussion instruments and things like that and that's been good so that's awesome i like i like the idea of going to more of the theory behind i know with my commit my high school community group um we are performance based so i never get to the nitty-gritty of the music and one thing that we've been doing since we've been social distancing is really taking time to go through the theory i have a few of them who actually don't read music so they've been taking music reading with me because all the performance is great but when you go for the college uh uh trying to get into college and they ask you to sight read you can't do it it's not good so we've really been working on that mr hartman let's hear from you uh well good evening um First of all, thank you to my favorite girl conductor for putting this together. Uh, it's super awesome to get to see a bunch of people who I don't know. Uh, so many times I get into Zoom meetings and it's everybody we, we talk with on a weekly basis. So I really appreciate your ideas and your perspectives from, from where you are throughout the country. Um, so thank you for bringing that to the table. Um, I'm, I teach in a, a large suburban high school in Kansas City area. And um, our struggles are twofold. First of all, curriculum, like we're talking about tonight and structure because it's completely unknown. Uh, we don't know if we're gonna be every other day. We don't know if we're gonna be, um, you know, delayed start or you know, we, don't, we don't know what our structure is gonna be to what we're gonna be able to work within. Uh, so one of the reasons um, that I'm in here tonight is just kind of figure out strategies uh, and brainstorm stuff that we can use in any structure. So uh, for, for me, uh, I have about 200 kids in my program uh, in five different choirs. Uh, so our numbers range from, you know, 35 kids in, in a small ensemble to over 75 in a, in a large one. Um, and so what we're trying to do is figure out um, how we can teach without singing. Uh, because we've been instructed on our, in my district that we're not going to be able to sing in school. That's going to have to happen outside of school. So um, we're focusing on, <clears throat> the first of all, technique. We're looking at um, anatomy and physiology. You get to talk about that stuff a lot. Uh, how your voice actually works, <clears throat> excuse me. And, <clears throat> and of course, the music history. Uh, and, and we're gonna focus on chamber music. Uh, in Missouri, we do solo and ensemble, um, small solo and ensemble work in the spring. Uh, so we're just gonna flip it this year when we come back and, and put everybody in, in the small ensembles when we first get there and really talk about and, and dig into some chamber music ideas, how to listen as a, uh, as a ensemble singer but more importantly, how to listen as a chamber ensemble singer, uh, as well as um, um, 
uh, putting the theory with it as well. So we're going to basically have a sit down class when I have them in class. Uh, and then we're going to try to apply that when they go home. I believe uh, Antoine said that maybe, uh, or maybe Eric did, um, the singing stuff at home. Now, uh, also what we've been doing is uh, we got together with a local composer. And uh, since our seniors didn't get a chance to graduate or baccalaureate or any of that kind of stuff, uh, we put it together with our seniors. Um, they picked out the lyrics or poetry and went and searched out different ideas. We compiled them together. We met on, online with a uh, local composer, uh, Dr. Ian Coleman. And, um, and he is collaborating with the kids to get the ideas about how the music should be written. And uh, so he's in the first draft phase. I mean, he's going to come back to us. And uh, the kids are going to have an opportunity to look at it, hear it in MIDI, uh, unfortunately, but um, and then be able to give feedback about compositional ideas, about uh, just basic musical ideas uh, to, to at the end where we have a full composition that the kids have helped create. Uh, and they're going to gift that to next year's seniors. And we're going to use that at the end of every year from here on out um, as, the, as the senior song. Uh, so that's one way we're trying to be a little bit creative without, without singing, but still thinking about music. Um, also, I want to uh, let you guys know, what's, uh, if you don't know Derek Fox, uh, he is uh, the Director of Choral Activities at University of Nebraska, Omaha. And last week he put out uh, just a simple Google form on his Facebook page. Uh, he had nearly 400 responses and he'd like to have some more. And basically what he's asking for is a lesson plan. Uh, whether it be elementary, community choir, church choir, all levels, all genres, all everything. And he's looking together to put, a to put a database together and be able to share those individual databases with anybody who wants it. Uh, so that when you, when you get to the point where you know what your structure is, how, how your school is going to work, or how your community choir is going to work, you have, you know, never fail lesson plans that you can go right to. And if you have something to add to that, well, that's what he's needing. He's, he's needing the critical mass right now. So uh, Derek Fox is his name. If you look him up on Facebook, friend him and fill out that Google form. And once you do that, he'll have your information to be able to share those files with you uh, and have a, an expansive um, standards-based uh, lesson plan for you to use within your ensemble. Uh, and again, thank you, Maria. And I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you gave a lot, of, a lot of great advice. Um, I love the senior song idea. That sounds super cool. And I like, you know, I just like the idea of the students having a part in creating. I mean, cause that's what we build. We really build a, a world of new creators, you know what I mean? Um, and them having a part in, in their singing and, and passing that on to the next group. I would love to have a project like that when I was in, uh, in when I was in high school. That, so that's, that's super cool. Um, Cody, you had your hand up and then I want to go to Dr. Jim Henry. It was uh, actually a question for Brian. Um, who in your in your community in your school district told you that you weren't going to be singing in the fall i'm lucky enough in my district we have a, a district fine arts director and um and he kind of coordinates all those things and that in his conversation with with he and I, now that hasn't been published yet but uh his conversation with he and i and kind of using some of these other guidelines that we're looking at and the space that we have available um that's kind of the, the way we're leaning that says you know, we may not be able to do that. My, my concern and the reason why I bring it up, and this, I had a, a little Facebook rant this morning when I rolled over and saw a mentor share a link that was like, good morning, you can't sing anymore. And my immediate reaction was, why are we in the arts world, specifically vocalists, the only ones who are questioning our existence? And when you tell people, and we know this for advocating for our programs, when you tell people that you don't matter, they will eventually believe you. And the same restrictions that we are currently under, so is art, so is theater when it comes to these, uh, these molecules that are flying through the air. Um, if there's gonna be football in Texas, I'm a sing in Texas, you know? So the, really, if you expand, not expand, what's the word I'm looking for? But the, the same concerns that we have, affects everyone but only we are writing articles about it and people are demanding a response not solution they're just they just want to talk about stuff and so suddenly you're i believe that your fine arts director finds themselves in a position where they have to make a call and not to knock your school district at all brian that's not what i'm saying i'm just i'm 
I just guess I'm reiterating why I'm so glad that, that Maria, you facilitate this conversation. Um, and we need to just keep in mind that we do not need to put a narrative in the world mm -hmm. that choir can't happen. Yeah. Because they will be sure that it doesn't. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I, sorry. I mean, I, and I'll come back to you, um, Mr. Hartman, but one thing that, that, that I took away from the call is, um, I'm sorry, you can't control my destiny. And so my destiny says that music has been around since the dawn of time. And it's, it's me, the music educator, the person who went to school and got the music degree. It's my job to advocate for music. And I'm always going to advocate for music. If you can play soccer, you can sing. If you can play football, you can sing. If you can, if you can play basketball, you can sing. I mean, think about, um, think about those of us who were living. Think about when, when Magic Johnson first found out he was HIV positive. And think about how, how people were nervous about playing basketball with him because he had you know, this, this unknown disease that we didn't know anything about. And then think about how he, he kept playing and how things got better. Like we have to control that narrative that it's up to us to save our industry. Not to say that it's bad. I'm not want to put fear out there that it's bad or anything like that, but it's up to us to advocate for it. It's up to us to say, you know, Mr. Admin person, I understand what you mean, but all summer long I've been coming up with these ideas and here's my plan of how we can have music. We have to be proactive in this. So, I mean, I'm, great point, um, Cody. Mr. Hartman, coming back to you. And then Caden has his hand up and Dr. Henry. Sure. Um, you know, the intention is never to stop singing for me. It's just a matter of when we do it. Um, and so uh, we made that very, very clear uh, as, as teachers when we were having this conversation that, um, A, we're talking about our livelihood here. You know, if, if you cancel all music classes, you're you, not only are you messing with teachers' lives, but you're messing with kids' lives. Uh, and and, and it's a very important part of what happens in our school day and it needs to continue. So um, I don't, I don't want to put it out there that, that I, I was advocating for or, or was told that I can't sing. It's just a matter of when, when that happens. Um, and also uh, I serve as um, our MMEA's, Missouri Music Educator Association uh, um, president-elect. And uh, with all that stuff that came out last week, it kind of shoved us into, um, you know, uh, crisis mode. Um, uh, our Missouri State School Board Association came out with a really horrible uh, list of recommendations uh, with some very, very poorly worded recommendations, one of which was cancel all PE and music classes. Uh, and so we've had to, to jump, jump the gun here in, in the last week and, and put forth a whole series of recommendations from music teachers um, of, of all levels uh, to make sure that the public understands that those are recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, and recommendations don't mean you have to follow them as edicts. They don't mean that this is what you have to do. Every, every school and every community has its own um, structure issues, has its own breakout issues. You know, folks in New York, you guys are dealing with stuff we're not gonna see here, probably, hopefully. Um, and so um, I, I wanna put it out there from, from the MMEA side of things that we cannot adapt the, uh, adopt the freak out first and figure it out later uh, mentality. We, that's why I love this conversation is because this is to figure it out now. Uh, and so whenever, whenever all these groups and there's going to be a bunch more coming out with the, with these recommendations that tell us we can't do what we do, uh, just make sure that you're staying positive with your people uh, so that, that you know that people are thinking about this and they know that people are thinking about this and everything's going to be okay. It may look different, but we're still going to be able to have choir. True. I like that. It may look different. And guys, if we don't know anything else, we know that change is always gonna come and it looks different. But we are resilient people, we are resilient educators, we are resilient musicians who can overcome change. We just did it. Like, keep that in mind, y'all. We just did it. February, we were in our classrooms having choir. March, they said, no, everybody go online. And we didn't say, oh my God, I don't know how to get online. You know, even, and even if we did, we didn't show it. We was like, okay, distance learning, let's go. And we figured it out and we did it. So whatever they say, we can figure it out. We can do this. Uh, Kaden and then Dr. Henry. Hello. Uh, so I am a church and community choir director in Joplin, Missouri. And I've heard a lot of 
uh, comments about taking your groups into sections like Soprano out to a tenor bass, rehearsing with them and everything. But my my big concern and my big question is how do we get an audience? You know, we we want to perform and we want to be able to sing together and everything, but do we allow audiences? Is this just for us to sing together? I mean, and then when we do, you know, rehearse in the smaller sections and stuff, what happens when we all come together? Uh, those are the things that I'm looking at right now too, is how can we get all of these people together and, you know, if we have a larger space, great, but if we don't, how do we get all of these people together to perform together and have people there to listen to what we've been doing? One um, idea I have for that, um, our church our church choir will look a little different whenever we get to go back to church, and that may be as early as June 1st. So one thing that we are doing is we're using our team, so we have like a worship team. We're using a worship team um, for live singing, the choir will be more of the, the video, uh, what's it called, virtual choir. Some of the choir songs will be more virtual choir um, at this time right now until we figure out something different. So that's that's one thing that we're doing at our church. Um, or just having just a few singers at a time sing. So I, I'm not sure. Can you some love? I'm sorry? Where are you from? Joplin, Missouri. Oh, you're Missouri. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how it is, how COVID is down where you are, but my, well, my church is located. I'm in, uh, we're in the heart of St. Louis and it's kind of bad in the community where, where we are. It's one of the hot spots in Missouri. Um, mm -hmm. That's why we're, we're distancing, we're distancing the choir where they're going virtual. And then our praise singers, which is a team of like four, actually be doing mm -hmm. live singing, but still being spaced out. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how audiences look um, for a while. And that's with anything. I don't see how, how audiences look for sports events, yeah. movie theaters, or and any of those things. That's, that's my biggest concern is because my community choir has one performance in the wintertime and one performance in the spring, and then that's it. I mean, and they're, they're made up of older people that don't work technology the best. It's not a younger choir that I can do a lot of virtual stuff with. And so that's what I'm kind of hoping is to find a way to make that easier on them, I guess, to virtually do something like that. But, yeah. Or you all can have, I've seen the churches with, and I think Eric just put this in the comments, but I've seen churches with the drive-through worship services where you got the people mm -hmm. inside and they're in their cars, but there's people like oh, yeah. distance out singing. Um, using all these wonderful microphones that can bend and twist and shape into all these different ways you know, to amplify the singing like that. I mean, we got to get creative. So, so those are mm -hmm. to do it. Um, I want Dr. Jim Henry. He, uh, that's my favorite teacher. Um, but also he's a professor at university of Missouri, St. Louis. So I want him to talk about what he does with his group, the ambassadors of harmony, um, which is a, I think they have over 100 voices in that group. So Dr. Henry, if you could talk to us about that and what you all are doing, We'd appreciate that. Well, I'm happy to do it, and I'm really happy to, to see you all and meet you all virtually. I wish we could all be together in person to talk through these things. Uh, but it really is a great pleasure to meet you all. And I do wear a lot of hats in our week. I come from a sort of a musical family. My wife is a middle school general music teacher uh, who's also an ORF specialist. So she's thinking about how in the world she's going to do what she does so successfully. I'm a college choral director at the University of Missouri St. Louis. Uh, one of our most celebrated alums is hosting this meeting, Maria Ellis. So uh, so I'm thrilled to join join with that. I'm going to talk to you what tell you what the Ambassadors of Harmony, which is a very large men's chorus that I uh, direct here in St. Louis, in the St. Louis metropolitan area. We actually have about 120 men, and I'll tell you what we've been doing. Uh, the one thing I do want to say is we, all, we have to pre be, be prepared for lots of ways to do this. <laughs> we can't just decide we're going to perform music and that's it. We might not be able to for a while, but we've got to keep our people singing. That's it. We're going to have to redefine what music making is for a while. Um, I'm not going to put, you know, I've got a lot of people that are high risk. We've got in that chorus everything from high school students to 80-year-old men all in one chorus. 
Uh, so, you know, I'm concerned about bringing them back together too soon. Here's what we've been doing on a weekly basis, if this will spark anything for you all. We actually have been doing virtual section rehearsals and basically they're run like this. Um, I, I help with the base section. So we use four people, but you could do this with two. Uh, but here are the four jobs. One job is to basically just lead the sectional. Uh, we tell people in advance, about a week in advance, here, here are the measures we're going to work on. We might pick out 60 measures or so um, of a song. Then as a section leader, we go through and mark up what things we know are problems areas for that music. We come prepared with that. The section leader leads that. Another person, but it could be the same person, could be the section leader, but uh, I share my iPad screen, which has a PDF of the score and an apple pen <laughs> and as we talk about what we're going to do we just scroll through and we highlight for everybody who's looking at the screen what we're talking about we highlight it on the screen we have another person but it could be the same person but but we use another person who's very good at singing the part and so he's very accurate very intelligent he does everything correctly so what we'll do is, his name is Andy, and we just say, Andy, will you sing this passage for everybody? We make sure everybody's on mute, Andy sings it, and then we tell people, sing along now with Andy. And Andy will sing it two or three times, he'll do it slowly if we wanna freeze a note, and we just tell everybody to sing along. Now, we can't hear them sing, that's true, but I know they're all singing, I know that their nose is in the music once a week. I can look at their, you know, I can see them singing along with Andy. And we're connecting to one another. So the music is still happening. We've let them know what we're working on. We sing it, they sing along with Andy, who's an excellent model. Uh, we go through things, then we say, does anybody wanna hear that again? Uh, people usually do, and then when it's fine, time, we move on. A, another person, and this is where you definitely do need a, a separate person, just monitors the chat window and watches all questions that arise and he interrupts at appropriate times to ask the questions so that the section leader can just worry about all that stuff and then the other person comes in and asks the questions that need to be answered. And again, we're showing all this, all this is being done while the music is being shared for everybody on an iPad screen. I really think that our guys have been really enthusiastic about this. They seem to be loving it. They know that they're singing or making a connection with each other. And uh, we kind of know that even though we can't hear one another, sort of spiritually, we're still singing together. And it does make you feel good. That happens for an hour and then in the next hour, the entire chorus comes together, all four sections in what we call a town hall meeting and we talk business, or we, we've had wonderful guest speakers who have come in and talked to us about any number of topics. That's been our rehearsal model for the past five or six weeks now. And you know, that may be what it's going to be for a while. I wish that I had a great answer uh, for preparing for concerts and having an audience. I think we just have to be ready for any scenario. And as Maria says, we're all creative people. And we can come up with a hybrid, we can come up with an online version, we can come in with an in-person in version. We, but we need, I think, to be ready for all of those uh, right now. <laughs> and pray that, that, that sooner rather than later we'll be able to all come together. And I think one thing that I do look forward to is we know we'll come together again someday. And just can you imagine what it's going to feel like the first time the, the singers all come together in the same room and oh, take an inhale and sing that first note all together. It may bring, I don't know if we'll make it to the second note because uh, it'll be an emotional time, but we're just praying for that and looking forward to that and it will happen. In the meantime, let's make music somehow, somehow, even if it's virtually. Okay, that's what I have to say. Oh, I love that, Dr. Henry. I almost had a tear because I, I can't wait for the day where I can hear like live, live music. But you know what? And, and for everyone who, um, who's admin may be saying, you know, music can't happen. I don't know about you all, but I have been to a lot of virtual concerts 
which have really been helping me during this time, like just some great, great music making by people who, um, I don't know, I sat through an Erica Baudu and Jill Scott concert the other day. Uh, Fred Hammond, who was a gospel artist, he had a concert. I sat through a Babyface and, and uh, Teddy Riley concert, and that one was, uh, it had comedy and music, you know? So I've, I've, the music is still here. Uh, Jennifer, Cabride wants to speak. So Jennifer, if you have the floor, love. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jenny. I'm from the Richmond, Virginia area, and I teach elementary school music. Um, and I think that we are all able to find something to focus on other than performance because we value learning music so much um, and we have enough experience with the learning process that we already know what that's worth um, but I think we're going to need to be doing research and have statistics and be ready to advocate that my class is still going to be impactful even if we cannot have this performance um, so i think that's something we need to be preparing over the summer too is you know being able to unfortunately defend in a way that we haven't had to before i think often performance is one of the main ways that we advocate for our subjects and so we're going to not only be having to dig into how can we teach this differently but also how are we going to prove to folks who might not understand that sight singing is worthwhile or learning about different genres is worthwhile. So it's just it's something else to, I think, kind of chew on. Of course, we all know that it has great value, but to be able to put it into words for other people might be something we need to be cogitating on a little bit. I like that. And I think, I hope that when this is over and everybody is filling out the information with the Google Sheet, please do that, that um, we could come up with some type of document or something that, that gives out the advocacy points. Like we could come up with that together. That way we don't have, no one has to feel like they have to come up with all the points on their own. So I'd love to keep, keep, the, keep these conversations going that yes, we, the experts in our fields are the advocators for what we do. So I, I would 100% love to do that. Um, Miss Cotton wants to speak. Um, and then I saw a question before you speak, Karen, uh, Karen, I want to make sure I say your name right. Um, Dr. I'm sorry, Professor Munkin wanted, wanted you all to know that tomorrow, Jay Champion will be holding a learning digital digitally session tomorrow. Um, so if you, if you don't, look, this is the time to hone on your skills. So if digital learning is not your thing, they have a session about that that's going to happen tomorrow, which uh, I will share on my page. Maria, uh, I shared on my, I shared on my personal page and my Me Music LLC page. So I shared on both of my pages information about that session. So if you don't know a lot about digital learning, the time is now to hone on your skills. She's offering a session about that tomorrow. But Miss Gato, go ahead, love. Hi, um, my name's Karen Gato, and um, I am outside of St. Louis in a suburb, Webster Groves, but I'm from upstate New York, so special shout out to my New York people. I watch Cuomo whenever he's on, just thinking about you guys. So uh, <laughs> um, I just, of, like everybody else, I'm freaked out by this, but not, I, there's been such a silver lining with this online learning where it gives us just a I mean, it just turned us upside down, right? And one of the beautiful things that has happened is <laughs> on Facebook and all, uh, all the other places, but really Facebook, where the old people hang out, um, I'm friends with, like, old students that, that I had who are now past college. There was one girl, I think she's actually a sophomore in college, who was recording music every night and putting it out on Facebook about five of the songs that she did I think were from when she was with me in middle school 10 years ago or however long it was it seems like 10 years ago and uh we give them the soundtrack to their lives and you know some of it was 
you know, a lot of it was folk songs like Danny Boy and Down to the River. And, but I don't want us to lose sight of that. And I think we have some wonderful opportunities to teach that standard repertoire. But I also, um, again, with middle school, I'm very protective of my little middle school <laughs> egos who join choir for the safety of the group. You know, we have like a third of them that will audition for every solo that's there and they're cool with it. Um, and then, uh, then there's the ones who are terrified, terrified. So I have the back of every t-shirt I have says, find your voice. Cause they don't even want to talk sometimes. And so this idea of them recording by themselves terrifies them. So, and I, you know, we've been doing this since March. I've had all these choice projects for them and some good, some bad. And these poor kids have been figuring out soundtrack and smart music because everything was free, which is great. Um, but I've learned a lot along the way in terms of how overwhelming that I look forward to being in the classroom where I can help them again live. Um, but I, I also wanted to just share to um, one of the reasons why I love middle school music is as I tell them, this is how most of some of you are going to find your people for the rest of your lives is that singing is a way for you to find your people because you can find a classical choir or a gospel choir or an acapella group that's how you find your people in college in after college when not everybody's the same age anymore and that's not gonna go away i don't think that's ever gonna go away um no matter what because things like the acapella app that we have so I, I just think this is a beautiful time for us maybe to really also strengthen things like one of the assignments I gave out the options was to find the harmonies in the songs that they love and sing that back to me with it playing behind them um, and, and I, I haven't done it yet because I couldn't wrap my head around it but to, to work more on improv this is a great time when singing in unison is not going to happen. Um, and I also, it, next year when we go online, I have connections as all of us do, including like this right here. I think it's a great time for us to start bringing in segments of people who have music as a profession, music, uh, and not just singers, but music business and uh I have a friend who's the recording sound guy for the Chicago Symphony. Like we, we have our contacts and then maybe we can network and get bigger contacts to tell, again, this thing, this isn't necessarily the way they find their people, but it could be the way they find their livelihood. So anyway, these are all awesome ideas and I love hearing all you, but I just, thanks. That's all I want to say. I think um, what's exciting about this time um, is literally, <laughs> anybody can be a star and anybody can be connected to anybody because we're in this digital world um i've had conversations with um like my idols by just like reaching out to them on social media and stuff like that and with things like tiktok where kids are already out dancing and becoming their own stars uh my motto is if you can tiktok you can multiply so my daughter who can do all the renegade moves well baby you can renegade if we can get this math problem done, we can get our multiplication together, honey. Let's go on renegade these problems. Yeah, let's get it. But but using that, using TikToks and things that the culture is already into, using that to teach. So maybe we maybe we go to their worlds, and maybe their world is maybe we come up with a cool TikTok song with the dances. Hey, five lines, four spaces is a staff. Hey, let's do it. You know what I mean? Like just figuring that those type of things out. So they can, we can still use use our music brains with what they're already into. So um, keeping those things in mind. Emily, Dr. Birch, are you still on? If so, she. So I, I believe that they're AC. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Don't judge my my PJs. I'm hungry. <laughs> Hi. It's, this has been so great, y'all. This is my eighth Zoom call of the day, and this has been the most positive and uplifting, and I love you. You are all amazing humans, and you're in the trenches, and you are doing incredible things. So someone at the university level with a little tiny children's choir, I adore you, and if you need a cheerleader, just find me on the Facebook. In fact, you can find the Advocacy and Collaboration Committee on Facebook and you'll find everything you need about how to advocate for these amazing things you're doing. And if you need someone to call
call up your principal, you call me. I can be very demanding in a very kind way. I am from the South. Um, if you like Maria, you're going to love my podcast tomorrow because she tells her times and I'm not a crier, but tomorrow around um, five o'clock PM, it's called music ed matters. And I'm sure Maria is going to post it on her Facebook page, but I would love for you to come listen to the podcast. It's literally the coolest people in the field sharing positive ideas and I want to be your friend. So it starts because Maria is amazing. Um, just because Karen is making a comment below, if you're not doing anything at two on Thursday, we can continue this advocacy conversation. But Maria, I'm following you wherever you go. This has been the best call of the day. Thank you. I did not ask her to do that. So thank you for the plug, but I was not asking for that. I want to be respectful for your time, guys. And this is seven o'clock, um, my time, which means we've been on for an hour. Um, please, 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 if you haven't already, please fill out the Google document. I'll place it on my Facebook page. Um, you can friend me on Facebook, Maria A. Ellis, or follow Me Music LLC on Facebook, um, Girl Conductor at everywhere else. That's, that's my uh, tag. But I will get this information out to all of you all so we have it. I'll start taking notes, and then I'll plan our next meeting. Thank you all so much for joining me. This has been amazing, and I'm excited about what we're getting ready to do. Y'all remember, it's us. We are the music makers, the dreamers of dreams. You all, thank you. Have a great night, and thank you so much for tuning in. See you all later.